Hey guys, <laughs> <laughs> welcome to <laughs> Adventure Fit Radio. Today we've got Chris Hadfield. Um, so Chris Hadfield was the first Canadian to walk in space. He was the first man to tweet from space. He was the first man to sing Space Oddity in space. But not the first man to sing Space Oddity. No, that's right. <laughs> and uh, he was the Lord Commander of the International Space Station. He's, he's done it all. He's a real um He was superstar. also... We we probably should have touched on this, but he was the or he was also the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, <laughs> and he um he <laughs> no I won't go along with that one. But geez, it's a good show. Um yeah, we spoke to John Snow today. It was a really <laughs> nice. Um, anyway, we spoke to Chris Hadfield, and um it was a really good interview. He's got so many stories to tell. The thing is, um uh, I suppose I'm just going to talk about the situation. So the situation was we had Chris. Chris is a very very busy man. Mm-hmm. Um, Joe Rogan had Chris for an hour and twenty minutes. Joe Rogan normally does three hour podcast. We were lucky enough to have Chris for twenty five minutes. It was via Skype, um, so on and so forth. So me and Tommy had so many questions we wanted yeah. to, to to ask him about, and we touched on some really good stuff. We could have gone into more. So this is probably what I think our our biggest guest we've had, guys. Um, but Chris is a very busy man, so as we grow, we'll be able to bring you more content from these guests. Yep. I think it's cool. I had a great time talking to him. Um, what did you think of it, Tommy? Yeah, I, oh, I'm pretty much on par with uh, what you said there, uh, Doco. I reckon um, oh, I would have loved to get more into like the, you know, the the shift from like mindset and the fucking aliens and, and space <laughs> and all that sort of stuff. I don't think you he know. was going to give you much no, about well, aliens, mate. Did. You asked him about aliens, and he gave you sweet fuck all. <laughs> he gave me nothing, but um. Yeah, he he's really just seeing a really really genuine guy. I actually, you know what? I really want to touch more on about his um, musical career because that's the thing that not many people know about him. And he's his clearly a, musician. a genius. His brother's the can Wikipedia. His brother. His brother's a good musician. Yeah, well, I saw that Canadian briefly and folk. Just, folk. Oh, he's folk he's Canadian folk, isn't he? I yeah. Think, um, so you'll also notice, guys, we we tried something different today. So yep. um, I tried uh, whether it worked well, whether it didn't. We made um, we made one person's absolute day, and that was yep. um, Aaron, one of my uh, one of Adventure Fit's reps from Sydney. So Aaron and Mitch are my Sydney reps, and and uh, I t- was talking to Mitch today, um, and he just spoke about how Aaron, Chris Hadfield is her absolute one hundred percent hero of life. Like she just he said if if Aaron could ask him a question, I was talking about us asking like readers questions or listeners questions if if um if she could ask him a question you know she would she would be so happy and if she ever got um the chance to ask him in person she would she'd um, burst out in tears and it would be the greatest day of her life and we gave her that chance yeah so so we we skyped her in at the very end of the show and it's kind of like a little all over the shop and a little you know we try to surprise her and and it's the first time we've done that so um forgive us it goes a little wacky at the end there and then we rush and we we, we uh we wrap it up with chris but um, yeah, we got Aaron to ask a, a final question, and um, sweet, yeah, it was good. So, our sponsors for Hit the me show up with a bill. They are Audible. So, Audible's an audiobook warehouse, guys. So, two hundred fifty thousand titles. Um, Audible's a great service. You can listen to books while you're in your car, while you're doing work, while you're walking the dogs. Any time that you're free, and you're, uh, you're mm. you can kind of you can do two things at once, rather than um, sit down and read a book where you have to focus on that book and that book alone. You can take in information, learn, you can be entertained all while you're driving your car. Um, what's the weirdest place you've audio booked, Tommy? <laughs> the the weirdest place I have audio booked has been in a circle church. In a circle church. I keep saying circle <laughs> That's church. four times a night. I know. No, I, I whipped out a bit of um, Rusty Young in a church. Um, I was just really bored. <laughs> in a church? Yeah, I was in a church. What were you doing in a church? Oh, I was, uh, you know... Church. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so that's a lie. But anyway, yeah, so Audible, <laughs> Audible's great, guys. You should check it out. If you want to get a free trial and 30 days, um, 30 days free trial and a free audio book, go to www.audibletrial.com forward slash ADVF radio and uh, check it out there. We're also brought to you by Adventure Fit Travel. Uh, we've got our Everest trip coming up, guys, this September through to October. 15 days hiking through the most amazing landscape you'll ever see getting to know the Nepali culture. I really think uh, if it's on your bucket list, then check it out at www.adventurefittravel.com. You, uh, you 100% won't regret it. Mm. And the Philippines, what's happening there? And the Philippines is going to uh, www.adventurefittravel. Very good. Yeah. So, uh, so check it out, guys, and here's the show. You 
guys are in Melbourne this morning. Is that right? Or this evening? We are, yeah. Yep, we're in Melbourne. That's boy, that's a beautiful city. It's my favorite city in the country for sure. We I did a couple speaking tours across uh Australia, one man shows around the country and my wife and I just love Melbourne. Had a great time. Yeah, it's spot on. It's except really, for the uh, uh, except for the weather, though, mate. The weather can be uh, appalling sometimes. Did you ever? Did you get some uh, some bad weather when you were here? I uh, no, no, we got lucky. It, it was great. Uh, oh, that's good. But you know, I'm from Canada, so my, it's all relative. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> hey, uh, so we're uh, we're already recording, Chris. So we'll probably keep that uh, that stuff in there. Um, so Hi. welcome, uh, welcome to the show. Um, firstly, what we're going to do before we get stuck right into it. Uh, what we normally start with is Tommy's going to sing you a tribute. Are you ready? Tom, I am ready for you to Excellent. sing me a tribute. <laughs> yeah. All righty, here we go. Beautiful. Hey, Chris, just before we do this, I was um, I always wanted to sing um, Space Oddity to you, but I, I only saw the video of you actually doing it yourself a couple of days ago. So I'm, uh, I've got big shoes to fill here. <laughs> I'm probably not going to do it justice, but uh, please enjoy, my friend. We'll see how we go. I'm ready. Ground control to Major Chris <laughs> Ground control to Major Chris Make sure you never shave that moustache forever long Ground control to Major Chris <laughs> I really hope that life up there was something bliss I grew a tash once but I looked like Donkey Kong Commencing countdown heading for the abyss Here we go This is Radio Tom to Major Chris I want to thank you for Joining us without a fuss This is Radio Tom to Major Chris I can't tell you how much I've been waiting to talk to you Thanks Chris Pleasure mate that was that was outstanding. That's the best version of that I've heard all day. <laughs> all day. Thank you very much. Is it uh, four a.m. over there? Or <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. Yeah, Chris. Nice. So uh, so let's um let's get right into it. We tell me what it felt like when you were hurtling through the sky, when you actually breached through the atmosphere, and you realised you were in space. Uh, yeah, I've flown uh, three different rocket ships. Uh, I flew the American Space Shuttle twice and the Russian Soyuz once. So three times, as you just said, I've hurtled through the atmosphere um, and and got above it and, and orbited the world. It's it's incredibly dangerous is the main thing. It, yeah. It's uh, crazy dangerous. And so most of everything that you are is all wrapped up in... Um, in piloting the ship and in, in trying to recognize any problems. So you're hugely involved in flying the rocket ship. But part of you, like almost like a little spectator sitting on your shoulder, just can't believe how cool this is, how exciting it is, how surreal it is. And you're getting squished in your chair and shake like like two or three people are jumping up and down on you. But at the same time, you, the sky goes from light blue to dark blue to black. And then, wow. and then the engine shut off, and instantaneously, uh, you're weightless. Wow. Just, I mean, it's, it's, it's spectacular. It only takes about a little under nine minutes from sitting on the ground, uh, getting ready to go, until the engine shut off and you're weightless uh, 400 kilometers up orbiting the world. It's, it's an amazingly improbable and hugely exciting and fun thing to do. That's... What were what were some of the thoughts going through your mind when you, like you said, you reached that that openness all of a sudden? It sounds like it was a very quick thing that you were all of a sudden out there. Well, you're kind of one with your ship, so almost all of your thoughts 
are, are, are keeping track of all of the systems that, that, that make the ship fly and that keep you alive. And as soon as you get to orbit, there's a whole bunch of things you want to check right away to make, the, that you, make sure your ship survived the launch, has no leaks, has no major failures. There's critical threshold after critical threshold. But, but as soon as you've sort of convinced yourself quickly that, okay, the ship is healthy, we've safely emerged on the other side of this, the, the first thing you want to do is, uh, is unstrap. You get this five-point harness over your shoulders, your waist, and up your crotch, and you un undo all five of those things. You float up out of your chair, and, and you pull over to the window. And when you launch out of Florida, like I did my first two times, by the time you pull to the window, you're over England. You know, it's, <laughs> it's so unbelievable. It's only 12 minutes later, you know, by the time you got there, and you're coming across Ireland and England and then arc down over Paris, and, and it should... <laughs> You, you shake your head. How can that possibly mm. be? Suddenly, that's your new reality, and and it happens so fast. It's uh, it's it's uh, it's it transports you, and it's 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 immensely technical, and and it's very very difficult. But at the same time, it's right on the edge of magic. That's um that's one of the most riveting descriptions yeah. of anything I've ever heard. Yeah, heard in my life, Chris. What what made you as a boy? What made you? It's not everyone can actually become an astronaut. What made you driven to uh, to to complete this goal? Uh, well, first it was you know Captain Kirk and and uh, oh, Captain nice. Nemo and and all the science fiction figures. You know, the, as a boy, comic books and and, uh, and all the heroes of science fiction or or just straight fiction, they're they're pretty inspiring because I think you know I grew up on a farm. I think they sort of give you permission to think beyond your own horizon, you know, to, to sort of have a wild idea. And it's not it's not uh, disapproved. It, you know, it's just kind of crazy. And then but what really changed my mind or, or, or determined what I was going to do, I think, was having my mind sort of expanded by all the, the fictional stuff. But then seeing the reality of it, like like seeing the first people fly to space and first people walk in the moon that those are real human beings just like me and and i think the 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 direct contrast between fantasy and the actual substantive reality i think the, i was just 9 years old when they walked in the moon and that it just it just kind of set a bit in my head that, hey this is possible even though i'm canadian we don't have an astronaut program it's possible this happens and so i just made the conscious decision uh, the summer that I turned ten, that that's what I, <laughs> Very I cool. turned myself into, and, <laughs> and that if I it never ten. happens, so what? At least uh, I, I changed who I was to become somebody that I wanted to be. But amazingly enough, uh, like has happened for a few Australians and a few Canadians, I, I did fly in space. In fact, three yeah. times and commanded a spaceship and did two spacewalks. So yeah, it's that I, I still feel like that little boy. But uh, but the reality is, I've spent half a year off the planet. That's wow. amazing. So, when you um when you were on the International Space Station, how long did you actually spend um how long did you spend on the on the ISS? Uh I on my three flights I went to two different space stations. Uh first one was to Mir, we were just there for a few days. Second one was to help build the International Space Station. We spent about a week there. And then my third time was to go live there and command it. We spent 5 months. Right. So if you took all that together, I spent just just a hair under half a year in orbit, and in that time went around the world like two thousand six hundred, I, I think two thousand six hundred and fifty times. I went around the world, <laughs> right. which, which wow. is just, sir, I mean, right across Australia, so many times and so fast, just just a handful of minutes, and you're all the way from Perth to Sydney. It's uh, it's it's surreal, and yet it is our one of our current realities. Hey, um, hey, Chris. We've got a we had a, a listener's question, and they wanted to know about some of the the mind and body um, shifts that that you may have uh, um, sort of had. Um, you know, first day as opposed to the last day. Did you did you have any sort of change in mind or, or thought process um, towards the end of the um, uh, of the missions as opposed to the start? Well, at, at first time, it's almost purely physical. There's huge physical adaptation when you take away gravity. Uh, you can't balance anymore. There's no up or down. Your digestive system changes. You can't burp anymore because the 
the gas doesn't collect at the top of your stomach. You, everything's just different. And, and the fluid kind of um, keeps getting lifted up to your head by your circulatory system, but there's no gravity to push it down to your feet. So your head swells up and your sinuses fill up. And, mm. and so it's, it's all physical. But after a week or two, that all starts to get to a new steady state. You start to become a little bit graceful in weightlessness. And then it becomes a little more mental. You, you start to, uh, to really notice where you are, not, not just with sort of like a, a gee whiz, wow, that's exciting kind of yeah. noticing, like you might if, if you walked into a, a fireworks show or something. Mm. But after a while, you start to get the nuances of the, of the experience. You start to really see the world for what it is. You can see the age of it and the changing gorgeousness of it. And, and I think somewhere along the way, by, by the end of half a year up there, you really see the world for actually what it is. One place, you know, and not a particularly big place. You can go around it in 90 minutes. You know, it's just, yeah. it's just a ball where we all live. It's, it's like if you never left your house and suddenly you walked around Sydney you, you'd recognize that, okay, these are just buildings, but wow, it's, it's kind of overwhelming. But after a week or two, you'd go, okay, this, these are just people like me. These are just buildings like the one I'm from. And in fact, the commonality of our experience far outstrips the difference. Mm. After six months in space, you feel that same way about the whole planet. And yeah, we've got outliers and, and people that do stupid things. But at the same time, we have a billions of people that do pretty, pretty incredible things every day. And you really see the, the shared nature of human existence from space. It sort of seeps into you like, like, a, like a peaceful eternity. And you come back uh, forever optimistic. You know, it, it's a pretty, pretty, nice, uh, pretty nice thing to have a chance to do in your life and, and then try and ex explain and, and show it to other people for the rest of your life. Chris, do, do you think, um, so I want to talk about the popularization of space. How important do you think it is? Because I couldn't agree more. I think that um, ex exploration in space, um, possibly finding life on, on other planets, microbial, or micro microbial, oh no, I'm nervous, <laughs> Mi okay. microbial or um, intelligent life, I think that's going to have huge implications for the betterment of mankind. How much, um, like, why is it important to tweet from space? Well, I mean, tweeting, that's just, that's just one form of sharing an experience. When the guys walked on the moon, NASA broadcast it live to the whole world. It changed the perception of billions of people because it was the original reality TV. You know, they, they didn't yeah. filter. They didn't tell you what to think. They just showed you the reality, what was happening. No matter what Neil and Buzz did, everybody was going to, if they started swearing or if they crashed or it didn't matter, it was just real. And, and so using social media now, it allows people to really get a sense of what it's like to live off the planet, to start to see the true reality of it and then form their own conclusions. I, I think the honesty of it is important. I think it lets people see this isn't some weird esoteric robot thing. This is just six people that we have figured out a way to permanently leave our planet. And and we started living on the space station in November of 2000. So if you're 15 and a half or younger, you've never been alive when people weren't living off the earth. You know, it's, it's yeah. a big step in, in history. And so I think sharing it is important. Same thing as me when my horizons were being stretched as a little kid. So it sort of gave me permission to do different things and, and maybe follow a different path. I think that's important. You've got to let people see beyond the noise of their immediate existence so they can maybe make a bigger or better informed decision in their life. Mm. And, and also, it helps to counterbalance the, the onslaught of, uh, of, of kind of negativity that, that seems to be sort of popular in, in a lot of the way that we talk to each other. And, yeah. and I mean, what just happened where we, we put a probe in this crazy orbit around Jupiter or that we find, think maybe there's liquid water under the surface ice of Pluto mm. or, or driving around and seeing liquid water on the surface of Mars and seeing thousands of other planets around other stars and, and seeing gravity waves from a black hole collision oh. that happened 1.2 billion years ago. All of that is within the last month. 
Yeah, you know, it's, just, it's crazy. And it's it's, inc- it's, it's incredible how far how far it's all yeah. come along, really, isn't it? Do you think? Um, what are your predictions for um, for mankind's kind of future as an interplanetary species? I, I know, obviously, there's all this um, Russian talk of Mars and the Mars One and Elon Musk. Where do you think we are in 50 years? Where do you think we are in 100 years? Where do you think we are in 500 years in a best case scenario? Well, talk is cheap. It's easy, and it's easy to say something that's going to happen 30 years from now because you have no responsibility. The reality is we have um, six people living in space. Uh, right now there's three, but there, there's a couple getting ready to launch here in, in a couple of days. Mm-hmm. For three more. So typically, we have the reality is we have six people living off the planet. We have probes right across the solar system, and the long-term plan is not to quit exploring. You know, we've 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 been explorers on the surface of the Earth for a million years. That that's how we got to Australia. It's how we got to New Zealand. We only got to New Zealand 800 years ago. No people had ever been there, but we're explorers. And just because we've invented rockets doesn't mean we're going to suddenly stop exploring. That's that's ridiculous. So I think the logical progression is the space station's up there for another 10 or 15 years, probably with 15 of the leading nations of the world. After that, uh, the next obvious place is the moon. It's only three days away, sort of like Antarctica for the last 100 years. Mm-hmm. I think that's how we'll explore the moon as a, as a scientific research outpost with permanent habitation. And then eventually on the moon, we'll have invented and tested and proven enough things that it makes it safe enough and therefore cheap enough to make it worth going to Mars. And eventually we'll do that. But there's no big rush. It's not, there's no point in doing it as some sort of stunt. Or if you do it as a stunt, it's really expensive and it doesn't last. So I think the long-term settlement just like we've done from Gagarin to the space station, that that's what's going to happen. Fifty years, I don't know. It's hard to predict how fast things will be invented. Yeah, for sure. But I think it'd be it'd be pretty reasonable guess that within a generation we'll have permanent habitation on the moon, and then hopefully we'll have figured out enough things to be able to get to Mars quicker, so that we can start uh, start truly looking for fossils on the surface of Mars. Uh, and and try to understand the rest of the universe as best we can. I, I think yeah. it's just going to be natural progression of what we've been doing for a million years. Beautiful, Chris. I um I love before how you were talking about um looking back at the world and seeing the simplicity of it. it. Just 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 for your own sort of personal, it made me um really think that you know all the troubles and everything that people go through is on this tiny little ball um in the middle of nowhere. That's really cool, but. I wanted to um I wanted to ask you just sort of change the the conversation a little bit here. Have you what was the most sort of hair raising moment in space? Was there ever a uh, a time or a situation where you're like, oh shit, I'm I'm this is this is serious. <laughs> um. Well, yeah, of course. Uh, uh. On on my second flight, the space station's main computers all ate themselves, and the station lost control lost communication with the ground and uh, the only way we could keep it alive was using the space shuttle to hold it in attitude while we rebuilt the main computers of the space station so that was exciting yeah. during, my, <laughs> uh, during my spacewalks uh, I was blinded by contamination uh, on my first spacewalk blinded by contamination in my spacesuit and so both my eyes were blind for about a half hour while I was outside on a spacewalk uh, which was which was not a challenge I expected to face. And then while I was commanding the space station four days before we came home, we blew a seal and started leaking the main coolant of the spaceship out to space. The liquid ammonia was spraying out into the universe, and we had to do an emergency spacewalk on 12 hours' notice to go out and and stop a huge ammonia leak. So, yeah, there's exciting stuff happens. How uh, How do you keep yourself... Under control in those in those uh, situations. Yeah, What's running right. through your head when you're when you're going blind in space and you're out in a spacewalk? I mean, you only did you say you only did one or two spacewalks over the whole journey, and one of them you you've yeah, lost I've, I've done two spacewalks. Well, uh, most of it is, is uh, preparation. I, I mean, no one has any idea. I don't think. Uh, how much work it takes to actually be qualified uh, to fly a spaceship. It's, it's, sure. a, it's a whole life's work. And, you know, I went to four different universities and I was 
uh, a test pilot in the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Navy and a fighter pilot in the Canadian Air Force. And that was just to get in the door. And then I trained for 20 years Ugh. as an astronaut. So, so part of the ability to stay calm and react appropriately is the learned product of all of those decades of, of preparation. And then the other is, while it's really happening, to constantly say to yourself, okay, well, what's actually the problem here? Okay, so I can't see. So what? Sometimes in the shower, I get shampoo in my eyes, and for a few minutes, I can't see. Mm. It's not It's not the end of the world. <laughs> Nobody I can still breathe. When that I can still talk. <laughs> I, you know, it's just, it's just a thing. You know, it's just a thing. And so... I think the real key is is to remind yourself that hard nothing is ever as bad or as good as it first looks and that you're 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 more competent than you think and and so long as you don't let animal panic take you over then you have a pretty good shot at uh, at doing something useful and that um the last thing is there's nothing more important than what you're doing right now and yeah. I think that's a re an important mantra to repeat to yourself you know, stuff that's 10 minutes away, that's just hypothetical. And anything that's already happened, that's just in the history books. It's just how you got here. Mm -hmm. All that really matters is what you're doing right now and try and do it as completely and well as you can and uh, and, and have, a, have a goal in mind. And so with that, you just, I mean, you can panic, but why would you? It doesn't really help. Nobody wants a panicked astronaut. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Hey, uh, Chris, let's, um, let's again change the uh, conversation. I feel like I'm a conversation changer here. Yeah. Um, let's, uh, let's talk about the cool stuff. Let's go to aliens. Um, did you ever see anything? This was the number one question I wanted to ask you about. Did you ever see anything out there that just looked kind of UFO-y or some things you couldn't explain or something that like wasn't quite a flying asteroid? Do you know what I mean? Like I want to, let's, uh, let's delve into that. Um, yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of science fiction and fantasy and, and the probability of life existing somewhere else in the universe seems to be pretty high. The, the more we discover, the more we find out just how many planets there are. And we think there are, I don't know, septillion planets out there. The number's so big you can't even describe it. It's like billion, trillion, quadrillion, all the way up to septillion planets. So there's probably life out there somewhere, but it, it's probably blue-green algae or, or, you know, maybe there's intelligent life. But categorically, no astronaut has ever seen uh, aliens. No, no. It, and people say, "Oh, they make you say that." No, nobody <laughs> makes that Canadian. I could say whatever I want. You know, I, I'm not. I don't work for NASA or Russia. I'm, I'm a Canadian, and and so there's a lot of wishful thinking, but of nobody course. ever has. Tell, that doesn't tell mean, us the truth. Yes, yeah. tell us the truth. We know you've got <laughs> a gun to your head yeah, over there right you now. Don't see things you don't understand. Yeah. I see stuff I don't understand all the time, every day. Yeah. That that's how you learn stuff. But I, I also think it's ludicrous that if you see something you don't understand, we go, well, I don't understand that. Therefore, it has to be intelligent life from another solar system. That's just that, that's just comical, you know. So I I, I um, we're looking. That's why we're driving around on Mars, and that's why we're uh, going by Enceladus and going out to Pluto and looking. That the big 500 meter telescope they just built in China wow. is going to be looking for signals from the universe to see if we can find other intelligent life. But so far, we've only found ourselves. And, but yeah. I think we see ourselves more clearly now than ever, too. Absolutely. Hey, um, hey, Chris. We normally we got, finish with. We got four, four more minutes, guys. Yeah, Excellent. beautiful. So, um, Chris, we normally finish with um, with some questions from myself and Tommy. But what I'd like to do, if you don't mind. Um, I spoke with one of my um, reps. I've got, a, I've got a, one of the reps for my company. Uh, sh I spoke to her partner today, Mitch, and we told them how you were coming on the show. And I would like to Skype in and get my friend Erin, who you're her absolute biggest hero in the world, and she's going uh, to be surprised. It's going to be a surprise. She's going to ask you one question just to wrap it up. Are you, are you cool I'm with that? Ready, ready. For Aaron's question, and let's hope the technology doesn't let us down. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> really. Uh, we're hoping for that as well, mate. The heart really, rate is uh, through the I roof. I really, really hope so too. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're bringing uh, bringing the call in now. See how we go. Here we go. I'm ready. Five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> Round this is control Chris to <laughs> Major Tom. <laughs> Mitch, you there? Hello. Aaron, hey, how are you? It's Doc. Hi, Hi well, this is, thank you. This is Chris. Can uh, can you hear me all right? I can, yes. <laughs> oh, my I'm, goodness. 
Welcome to Adventure oh, Radio, Aaron. Your, is your name is your you. name Aaron? Is that right? It is. Yes. Yes. Hi. We've got about three minutes with Chris Hadfield. You've got the final question, the final say. What do you want to say? Oh my goodness! First <laughs> of all, I am just so unbelievably pleased to be talking to you. I love your book. I really the sentiment of all the messages that you've given in your book. It's just brilliant. I really thank you. I think the the perseverance that you've had in following your dreams is amazing. Thanks. Um, <laughs> as far as questions, I don't know. Oh, yes, we've, come uh, on. we've put you on the spot here, Erin. <laughs> I don't know where to start. Um, so I probably, I guess I'll ask something about your kids and maybe what, what did they learn about you from, from reading your book? Uh, what are my kids? My kids are all in their 30s uh, now. I think... Um, having that influence their whole life, I think they learned maybe the most important thing was uh, be curious, but don't let ignorance persist. Like if you're curious about something, look it up, find out the answer and use that information to maybe stand a little higher so that so that then you're more informed for the future. So I, I think it's, my wife and I, it's an example we tried to set. Uh, both in our professional lives, but also at home. My wife's a, a professional chef, and she used to work as a computer programmer. But we always felt that um, you should be curious about how things work. You should figure out how this particular thing works, and then just add that to your arsenal of understanding of the world and build from there. And we have three interesting children as a result. And uh, and uh, I, I think maybe it's it's a good way to conduct life. Mm. There you go. Yeah, I, I agree. Thanks, um, Thanks for the uh, – hey, Ez, we've got, uh, we got to wrap it up with, uh, with Chris. That's, um, just wanted to get you in there for one, uh, one question, so thanks for leaving it on a oh, perfect note. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> thanks. Lo- lovely to talk to you. Thank you very much, and I'm glad you enjoyed – I'm, I'm writing a fourth book right now, so I, I hope it's up to your standard. Oh, I wait. Thank you, Brett. <laughs> Chris, thanks, uh, thanks so much for coming on the show. Where can they find information about you just quickly in 30 seconds? So I know you've got to get out of here. Where can they find you? Oh, just uh, chrishadfield.ca. Uh, it's, just, it's got all the information, all the places I'm going to be speaking and what I'm up to and what I... I just, I just played guitar with um, Rick Wakeman and, and Brian May and uh, Hans cool. Zimmer last week. There's always cool stuff going on. So, uh, so yeah, chrishadfield.ca is probably as good a place as any. Awesome. Beautiful. Thank great, you so much, Chris. Great way Absolutely to wrap it up. loved it, mate. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, folks. And that's a wrap. Hey, guys. That was the Chris Hadfield episode. Really hope you enjoyed it. Gang, the, uh, the best way for us to get more time with a superstar like him and bigger and better guests, um, not that there are many, than uh, the great man, Mr. Hadfield, please help us by subscribing to the show. So jump on iTunes on your podcast app on the phone or on, on, uh, on the computer. And click that massive purple button, guys. It's going to help us out. The more listeners we get, the uh, the better we look. Um, while you're at it, guys, and if you feel like you missed anything from the show, you can jump onto the website, www.adventurefittravel.com. Jump onto the show notes page. Bill's making me laugh for you guys. He's pulling funny faces. Um, the I, better uh, we look. Yeah, he's giving me a weird look. Yeah. <laughs> um, jump on the show notes page, guys. It's got everything that we spoke about during the show there. Really, really, so there's some really good content there, my friends. Uh, while you're on that website, let's just uh, join the mailing list. That'll be good. That's our best bang for buck, guys. You can keep up to date with uh, things that me and Bill are up to and anything ADVF. As per every week, guys, we are brought to you by Audible. Go to audibletrial.com forward slash ADVF radio to get your free one month credit for a book. I'm reading. A really awesome book on uh, self-help, that sort of stuff. And Bill's just finished a uh, book called Something About Influencing People. What was it? Uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People. That's right. That's right. So that's a good read. Also, too, guys, we are brought to you by Adventure Fit Travel. Adventure Fit Travel has a Mount Everest trip coming up. It's a 15-day trek going to base camp and uh, looking at possibly one of the tallest, the tallest, I just said possibly, I'm clearly half asleep. That is probably, You've nearly if made not it, mate. You've nearly certainly, made it all the, way the biggest and tallest mountain in the world. Guys, going to be insane. 15 days. We've also got Philippines coming up and others. Alrighty, we will speak to you next week. Bye-bye.
Discovery Roger, go for deploy. Where? 